empty seats. So <laughs> if you want me to shut up, you better come to the front. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Tim and Kathy, right. get in here. Right. <laughs> okay, we got two more. All right, John. Dave and Queen are coming too. All right. The seats are taken. Service can begin. Thank you all for coming. First one on the right hand Again, thank you for being here. It's such an amazing thing to look out and see all the people and the people that are behind out there. Um, and we were going to have a, a prayer service out there, a traditional Lutheran, um, but have decided that we'll just do it right now. Um, but I was going to share about a thought that I had uh, driving over here today about uh, Corey Ten Boom and The Hiding Place. And uh, her sister had made a quote from uh, when they were in prison in Robinsburg during the war, World War II. And um, they were in this tiny cell. And they were actually having a Bible study and teaching people. And it was just full of lice and itchy things. And it was just that the guards wouldn't even come in there. And she, she made a comment. Uh, there is no pit so deep that Christ is not deeper still. And sometimes we go through things in life that are like that. Very deep places that are very dark. And we know from what Chloe's sister said that Christ is deeper. And we know that from the scriptures. It's all over the Bible. Christ is deeper. And he holds us and he comes to us, and he surrounds us. And that's what we pray for today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we begin this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you that you are here in all of your form, Lord, and that you have been with us through this road that we're on. And you will continue to be with us as you are the way. And you are the truth and you are the life. And we need not worry, we need not be anxious, because you have your eyes set on us. And you go before us. Bless this time of service. We thank you for our brother Dave, for his vitality, his love of life, his things that he just continued to share with all of us. We thank you for that. Most of all, we thank you that he loved you, Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Let's sing the song, Here I Am.
Christ, the source of all mercy, and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all our sorrows, so that we can comfort others in their sorrows, with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Shall we pray? O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother David. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love. As a companion in our pilgrimage on earth, in your boundless compassion, console us who mourn, give us your aid, so we may see in death the gate to eternal life. That we may continue our course on earth in confidence until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before us, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. A reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. Our New Testament reading is one that Chris just had on his mind, and we actually found it from Colossians, the third chapter. This kind of reminded him of his father. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Servants, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for people, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid. I'd like to call on Adam and Chris. Sure. Well, I'm going to do it this way, Dad. I'll do it. I'll wing it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, 
my, I have a really good friend, Josh, and uh, he lost his mom. He uh, probably got through this a lot better than I did, but, or will. But he, uh, he talked about it as, you know, when someone dies, it's like a, a great ship crossing a sea. And as you watch that ship from one shore, you say, there she goes. And uh, you have to remember there's the other side of that ocean. And uh, there's people on the other sides, and here she comes. So I just picture a uh, you know, dad up in heaven with all of those past friends and family members. And uh, I just I, I cherish all those, all those moments we were working together on church steeples or high places and doing risky, risky kind of jobs. You, you start talking about, well, what if? What if? If something happens, and uh, we always said, if when, when we do die, celebrate my life, and that's that's what he would want. He wants us to celebrate his life, and if, if you want to do things for for the family, just you know, come up and tell us your favorite stories of you know, who who my dad was to you and, and what he meant to you, and and uh, he set the bar pretty high as a dad. I mean. I'm, I'm like my dad, I'm always prepared. Someone <laughs> so pointed out I had a diaper in my back pocket, and I'm like, well, at least I'm ready. <laughs> and, um, you know, just working with dad this summer was, was amazing. You know, he, he retired a while ago, um, and Chris and I would just kind of use him as our, our gopher, and we'd tell him, all right, we need, we need more gutter coil, or we need some wood. What are you doing? I'm playing the game. I'm like, well, forget the game. You're coming to work today. And he always would. He was, uh, he was a great gopher, and he would help us out. And Chris and I had started that on, not need him as much as wanted, wanted to be there working with us. So this summer, um, I brought him with to the, the first real big church steeple in Stillwater that I got to work on with him. And it's, uh, it's one of the biggest ones in Minnesota. And he... Before him and I worked on it, his prior boss before him worked on it, and up inside these steeples, there's there's spots where only the steeple jacks go up there and write things. And he, in his handwriting, it was back in the 70s he worked on it. And before that, when his boss was a young man, he had worked on it. And then getting to work on it in '97 with him, and then this last summer getting to go up there and and work with him. And, I don't know if anyone saw that video that my mom put together, but that last video at the end of him swinging around, he was like a young mannequin once he got out of that, that steeple. And he just, uh, he was, like I said, he was an amazing dad. He, he taught my mom that work was important, but you have to have fun. You have to have fun. No matter what, we were working all day, and he's like, ah, oh, that's it. I'm like, well, if we work just a little bit longer, he's like, no, nope, we're, we're going boat, we're going fishing. Now it's now it's time for fun. You need to you need to bring that joy into your life. And you can look at those pictures back there. Uh, Mom and Dad set the bar pretty high for packing as much excitement into a life as you can. I'd like to thank uh, Neil Christensen actually made that frame for me out of the wood that we we took down. And Neil also made this cross uh, out of that that church wood. And, and that cross is going to go up inside that steeple this summer. And that's, that'll be his little shrine, and the only other people that will probably ever see it are, you know, the other steeple jacks, but the bigger the man, the bigger the monument, so every time you drive through Stillwater, you can look at that church and know uh, his legacy is up there. So Chris, uh, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I made it, so. <laughs> color is it? Yep, that's the one graphic. So, um, and then uh, words, or a picture can say a thousand words. So I can 
stand up here and talk and talk and talk, but take a look at all the pictures that we have. We also have a video. There's more pictures and stuff back at the farm that we're going to do. Um, take a look at those. They can say way more than what I ever could have all my dad. Um, things that he taught us that we're carrying on and teaching our kids are lifelong legacies. I had a speech, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to do this, but going through the line and meeting every single one of you has just been the most uplifting, spirited, great thing that I have done. And I thank all of you for showing up and coming out here and to uh, give me remembrance to our dad. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. We have time if somebody would like to come and share. Come on up. Well, hi. So Dave was not just a great husband, dad, father, um, or grandpa, but he was a great father-in-law to me. Adam always said to me, you know, I wish you knew who my dad was when he was younger, because he was a great man. And I said to him, no, I didn't need to do that, because I fell in love with a man that I knew when he was, you know, going through his dementia. So I loved him for who he was then. And, you know, we had a lot of fun times together. Uh, when I had my jaw surgery, I was stuck at the house, and when I was kind of like bed rest with Garrett here, I was stuck in the house, <laughs> and I couldn't do almost anything. But Dave and I would have all these fun little times, and we played games. He taught me how to do quite a few old games. Um, we'd watch silly movies on TV, because I couldn't do anything except lay on the couch, basically. And we'd watch sci-fi movies. And we laugh, and we look at each other at the end of the movies, and we'd be going, oh my gosh, that was the silliest, stupidest movie. And we just laugh. I woke up in the middle of the night hungry, and I walked down the stairs, and Dave would be there, or he would hear me, and we'd come out, and he'd just he'd give me this nod. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. And we'd get some milk out, and we'd get some Oreos, and we'd have an Oreo ring, or whatever dessert was out. A lot of times there's cake, and we just eat the whole thing. <laughs> um, you know, one of the greatest moments for me was this boundary waters trip that we went up north this summer. Um, he was a hero to me at that moment. Uh, we were out going to the campsite where Adam, the kids, and Heather and Chris were. But we were staying at the cabin at the lodge area with Garrett and Lana and Edie and Dave. Well, we were going out onto the boat and it started raining and we had no cover except this plastic tarp. And Grandpa was the driver, right? And he stayed out in the outside part of the boat trying to get us safe back to the cabin and we were under this tarp. And he was just letting the rain pour on him and he was trying to cover us up and keep us warm because he wanted the babies all warm and us. And he was a true hero at that moment for me. And I told him that. We had a lot of love last right? And who do you always want to go to? You always want to go to Papa's house, right? So that's Dave and Edie's house. is always Papa's house to us. And always will be. So I think that's it. All right. It becomes obvious today the number of friends that the Hanson family has. When I came in here, 
There were people lined up down for the street waiting to get in and go through. There's over, well over 300 in this parish here at the church, and I'm, I'm sure there was at least that many more that had not remained around here. So it gives a tribute to what the Hansons were and how much they were loved. I probably knew Dave Hansen longer than anybody here because he moved uh, to uh, 50 of the Quas Avenue, a little farm down there next to Cy Tesh's farm. And our home place was about two miles north. They came in 1960. Larry was 11, Dave was 9. Everett and Donna brought those two young men out there. In a few years, they had three more boys. Interestingly enough, uh, three of those five boys have all have worked for me over the years, but we, they joined Trinity Church right after that, so as a result, that, that was the year I graduated from college and started a teaching profession for about ten years, and uh, I got to know him in church, Sunday school, I taught Sunday school, and became very good friends, especially with Dave. Uh, when he was in about the end of his junior high year, ninth grade, I think, eighth or ninth grade, uh, Maxine and I had moved another mile down the road and bought a farm. And I raised some beef cattle and raised broilers, chickens. Uh, it's actually on the, the place where Roger Roy lives now. There was a three story barn. And uh, in there, I would raise uh, bro uh, broilers. Uh, 8,000 at a time, and uh, Dave helped me there a lot. Larry too, and they would recruit guys to help me catch the chickens uh, when we sent them off to market. They went up to St. Cloud, so we would start catching chickens at night. We'd put the blue lights in, so the chickens couldn't see you, you can see them. And a couple of older guys like myself would catch the chickens, Tip them upside down, four in each hand. The boys would come and grab them and head down three flights of stairs and take them to the trucks that were waiting down below. We were able to get 8,000 chickens out in less than three hours. And they were, they were sent up to, uh, to St. Cloud uh, and, and Golden Plump. You've heard of that. That was the Ellison brothers that was just starting out. We, I sent them to them. Dave then stayed, and a couple of times Larry, Always stayed to help me clean the barns afterwards with a couple other guys. I'll never forget uh, when you've got shavings this deep and then you've had chickens in there for 10 weeks with droppings on it. You can tell that they've been around and we would take big scoop shovels and clean. And I'll never forget this because Dave, he's a hard worker, kind of, kind of reckless actually. <laughs> and uh, he was cleaning and where the waters were, it would get slippery. And you know, chickens and the older folks know what the smells like around water and the droppings. Dave was cleaning and he went by one of those with a scoop full and slipped. Flipped straight backwards. The scoop shovel went up, everything dropped right down on his head. <laughs> the rest of us just roared. Dave didn't think that was real funny. He got up and started working again. Through high school then, Dave uh, uh, continued to do that. He helped me clean up in the cattle barns too. Uh, and when he graduated, uh, he'd stop out to the house a lot. And one year he graduated and came out, he had bought a car. And like I say, Dave was a free spirit. And he came out to see my son Todd. He says, Todd, I want you to ride in my new car. It wasn't brand new, but it was new to Dave. And Todd was in sixth grade, he said, I want you to get the back seat, and we're going to go for a ride. Todd was excited, yeah, we're going to go with this big stud, I'm going to go for a ride. So, unbeknownst to Todd, that Dave had wired the back seat with electricity. <laughs> <laughs> and off they drove, and he was driving down the road, and pretty soon Dave flipped the switch, and Todd went right straight out of the seat, put his head on the roof. <laughs> and Dave stopped the car and just laughed and laughed. He, he pulled a trick on him. He graduated from high school in about 1970. Him and Edie were married in 73. In that time, he learned to be a real steeplejack, to be honest. He wasn't afraid of heights, like Adam is not today. Uh, 
did that for a while, and then he started working for Bob McCabe. Bob was just across the road from where he had grown up, and uh, uh, <coughs> Bob was an excellent painter, had a good painting business, and Dave became an excellent painter. In fact, Bob and Dave did a lot of work for us because we had a construction company. And over the years, they worked many times. After about 20 years, Adam had gotten to age, and, and they decided that they were going to go on their own. And uh, uh, so I used both of them. They both did jobs for me, uh, both commercial and residential. Both of my homes, Adam's worked on all three of them. But uh, I want to tell you about two of the jobs, because Dave was good. He was fussy. And if he took to the wall, he put a light on it and sign it and see that meter was perfectly flat. So when he painted it, because that would show a problem if there was imperfections, he would correct the problems. At any rate, two jobs I'd like to tell you about. One was up in uh, northern Minnesota. We had built a new lake home. And uh, my nephew, Corey Hendricks, was a general contractor out of Brainerd and did the construction. And he was very good. He had worked for Norsan, who built this church. He had been a superintendent for them. And uh, he said, I'd like to have my subs. They're really good, Jerry. I said, no problem. I said, only two people that I'm going to use. And I said, uh, one is the carpet man, who was a lifelong friend of mine who owned a carpet company. But I said, I'm bringing my painter up from Watertown. And so Dave and Adam came up. And uh, like Adam said, they would work during the day and play during the night. They had the airplanes they flew, they used the pontoon, they went swimming. Edie came up to the lake and, and with us. And one thing Dave told me, he said, Jerry, he said, I've never followed behind a better taper than you had up here. I never had to fix one spot. He said, we just painted it. And he said, this is the finest, finest job I've seen. And I know it would be good because what Dave thinks is good, it was good. And the other job that he did near the end, you know, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, was down at where Snap Fitness is today. We were doing a, a building, and uh, if you'll notice out there, there's, it's, a, it's a overhang and a drive-through, and we added on to it with old gas pumps and so forth and inside. And the company that was taking it was designing it so it would be back to the 50s. So all of the colors in the building were back to the 50s. 23 different colors. Dave and Adam did that job. That company had not one complaint when we got done. And we got all done. Dave came in with 23 cans, all marked with a sample. If we had any problem with any of the paints, we could touch up. That's how meticulous and good he was. Going on, and, and uh, I want to talk about Dave as a, as a man. He had a great family. And uh, that, that Hanson Fun Farm has been a source of fun for, for many years out there. And I think back, and uh, Chris, I remember what he said to us here a few weeks ago after Halloween, and they had had another haunted night out there. He got up and told the church, he said, well, he said, if I remember right, Chris, you had 900 people came through that night. We had 80 volunteers that helped us. Now, that shows what people thought of them. And he said, we raised close to 2,000 pounds of food, wasn't it? And about over 2,000 pounds of food and, and a bunch of money. That's been going on for how many years? <laughs> okay, they don't even know. At any rate, uh, that's what they've done for this community. And I, that goes to show what the Hanson family has meant to everybody. It's going to be a little tough here. <laughs> uh, Dave and I, uh, like I said, we go way back. And about 15 years ago, I was up at the lake, and it was winter, and I decided uh, there was one tree hanging over the lake, and there was nice, froze nice, so, and there was a branch that was out of it, and I took one of my chainsaws, because I love to work in the woods, took a steel extension ladder, 
down there and put it up on the ice and up in the tree. And I was going to drop this branch. Well, dumb me, I didn't look at the branch. Normally it dropped straight down, but this branch was curled over this way. So it didn't drop straight, it dropped sideways down. When it came down, I saw it coming. I threw the chainsaw, hit the end, bottom of the ladder, flipped it out, and I dropped 12 feet onto the ice. Before I got through with the x-rays at the emergency, I had 12 broken ribs, broken shoulder, bleeding on the brain, and 10 stitches in my eye. I was in the hospital for four days, and I got home and laid in bed, and I couldn't lay in bed. It hurt so bad, the pressure on the broken ribs, that I had to, my wife got me up by the head, took me out, we went to it in, in a recliner. And I spent eight weeks in a recliner, half sitting and half laying, because there would be no pressure on my ribs. Lots of people came to visit me. A lot of friends came out. Uh, I remember uh, Paul Neswell, Marty Mallman, and, and uh, oh gosh, I just, uh, Kurt Nelson came out. One man, one man came to see me every week for eight weeks. That was Dave Hansen. I feel badly, baby, that I've never told him just how much that meant to me. Sitting in that chair all day long for eight weeks, we sat and we talked for a half hour to an hour every time he came out, but he came out every week. That's the kind of man Dave Hansen was. So I'm going to sing a song, Edie asked, and, and, and I'm going to sing a song. It's, it's called, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. I'm going to go over there and take a mic and explain a little bit about the song and then talk to you. Thank you. 
little bit later. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Let's pray. Precious Lord, you are always there to take our hands, carry us when we need to be carried. Walk with us, hold us. We thank you that you have come into our world, into our life, that we gather here today in your name, Jesus, because you are here in this very room, because you love us so deeply, and you will always go with us. Christ. Before Adam and Sarah got married at the fun farm, I asked them to find a cross. And they asked Adam's father to make one. Now, I have seen many crosses and I actually collect crosses as well, but I have never seen one so beautiful. Dave put it up in the pool high up there in the window, so that we could not miss it. When we had the wedding out there, it had a significant presence. And every time I've been out there since, it reminds me of Dave. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but more importantly, it reminds me of Jesus and his presence in the handsome family. When you're looking at the pool, when the sun is setting in the west, it is the cross you see on the water. Edie told me that. Before Jesus went to the cross to give his life, he gathered the disciples together and he told them not to be afraid. In those days, a cross was something to be afraid of. And they had already seen too many crosses outside the gates of Jerusalem. It was the Roman way of torture and execution. Don't let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said to them. Trust in God, trust also in me. And then he goes on to tell them all about heaven. Why does he do this? Why does he tell them that in his Father's house there are many rooms or mansions, and that he's going ahead of them to prepare a place for them to come to? And why does he tell them that he's going to come back for them? The disciples had no idea what he is saying because he is right there in front of them. Why does he tell them all these things? Because in just a few days, the cross upon which Jesus died will be empty. And the tomb in which he was buried also will be empty, and Jesus will be alive again in just a few days. It is too much for them to comprehend. One thing that they learned during those horrible days was to trust Him. Trust in God, trust also in me. Edie and Chris and Adam, you've been hit by a hurricane. The one whom you love deeply is no longer with you. Gone so suddenly, and none of us can fathom the deep, deep pain that you and your family are going through right now. Our hearts and tears flow out to you. We are here with you. You are not alone. Just like the disciples gathered that early Sunday morning in the room behind the locked doors, waiting for God to do something, so we are at Peace Lutheran Church waiting on God for his river of life to flow through all of you, and all of us too, to give us sweet comfort and assurances that we have a good shepherd God who will pick us up on whatever road we travel and carry us to our destination. It's only one destination, 
And we believe that David is there in that destination. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? In the midst of this tragic death, we ask those questions too. Lord, where are you? Where were you? Who is the way? Where am I going to go? And then whom can I trust and lean on now in these awful dark times? And the answer is right here in this passage from John. It was on your lips, Evie, the other night when I asked you what you'd like to have the scripture be. Right away, those words just came out. As Jesus responds to the questions of Thomas. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way through this, through these dark times. I'm the only one who can answer your difficult questions. I'm the only one who goes before you like a pillar of fire in the night. I am the only one who can, you can count on for the truth. I'm the only one who died so that you might live with me in eternity. Along with those who have gone before you, I am the life, the only life, and this life I give, I give to you now, so that you will know that you are on the right road. And it is the right road, because we are pilgrim people going together towards the light. I remember in the early days of this church, we met downtown at the community center, and it was many Sundays just before the service started that I would go and find Dave. He was always there every Sunday. I would ask him for the light. He was the only one that had the light back in those days. None of the rest of us smoked. <laughs> he had that special smile on his face, you know. You know. <laughs> and I would come the lighter, and he would do the honors, light the candles. He was our acolyte. He lit us up so we could start worship. That's the way it was with our brother Dave. He was a fixer. If something needed to be done, he would find a way. I miss those days, those early days, because they were sweet and beautiful. We all chipped in, and we <laughs> had chairs to set up and hymn books to put out on the chairs. That was your job, Luke and Alan putting out those Bibles and hymn books on the chairs, and others too. You know, sometimes when we lose someone we depend upon so much, we feel like an orphan. Like we have no one to connect to, no one to hold on to, no one to have those intimate times with, no one to share our joys and our sorrows with. But Jesus counters our feelings as he speaks to his best friends. He says in my favorite part of this passage from John, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. It's not just a sentence out of the book, but that is a promise. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. What he says, he does. He comes to us in all of our circumstances. He is the guy who comes and comes and, and, and will continue to come always to us, even when we don't want him to. He will come. Jesus will come, because we are the apples of his eye. He made us, and he tended us, and then he marked us with his cross, and our baptism, and, and we have been ransomed by his precious son, Jesus, who gave his life so that we might not walk in darkness, but might have the light of life eternal life. And Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. There's no deeper promise, no better way of saying I love you than this. It gives us glimmers of light through the night of our sorrows, saying that there will be a new day coming when all will be changed. Because I live, you also will live. Pray, Father, thank you for sending us the best gift, this Thanksgiving time. And although we 
grieve and grieve and grieve. We're thankful that we have a future and that you hold the future for us. Just thank you, precious Lord. Bones right. 
trap. <laughs> Yeah, this is a Christmas song. Come on, ring those bells. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's what we pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion. In the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, that through the grave and gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that your Holy Spirit will lead us in holiness and righteousness all of our days. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet night. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you they may know the consolation of your love. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection to life everlasting. God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also. And that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on our earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and to your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, David. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints. For the benediction, the family would like you to come out to the fun farm immediately following the service where you can greet them and there's some food and some fellowship. So uh, please uh, do that. It's okay if it's crowded. It's okay. Yes. Plenty of food, Lily says. Thank you. Yes. And also, uh, since there's going to be eating kind of right away when you come, we're going to just do the dinner prayer now, okay? Lord, just uh, bless our travels and our time together out at the fun farm. As we partake of food, we ask your blessing upon that food. Just thank you for all the people, all the hands that have prepared food these last days and brought it. We just thank you for all the the friendship and love that has been expressed today. And we ask that you would continue, Lord, to use friends and family to mend and bind. In Jesus' name, amen. Now as you go on your way, may Christ go with you. May you go ahead of you to guide you, behind you, to encourage you, beside you, to befriend you, above you, to watch over you, and within you, to give you peace and joy. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amazing grace.
Amen.